Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. What is up, rock and rollers? Yep, it's that time. Another exciting episode of the Rich Redman Show where we talk about all things music, motivation, and success. And I'm really fortunate because I've got my co-host, co-producer, great drummer, great friend, Jim McCarthy. Jim McCarthy, voiceovers.com is with us today. He's not here on every episode, but Jim, you are here. Thank you for being here, buddy. I'm here when I can be because I love being here. Well, I love hearing your voice. It, you know? it, it hurts me when I'm not here. Well, you're busy. If somebody's interested in starting a podcast out there, they should go to you because you're producing like 20, 25 podcasts right now, right? It's crazy. You know, a lot of juggling. And I'm trying to fit in drumming, man. I'm getting back into playing again. I'm so really you said you were playing last finding... night. Where was that, Jim? Where'd you play last night? In my, uh, you know, my closet where the drums are. And I've been just, yeah. you know, put Spotify on. I've been doing the Huey Lewis and the News playlist, which oddly enough doesn't play much Huey Lewis in the News, but a lot of the stuff that I, I used to play along with the radio yeah. back in the day. So whatever yeah. came on, I would play it, you know? And it's kind of the same kind of uh, feeling to it, even though I could skip songs. But, I think that's you know. probably what our guest today also did, because we're of a similar era. Uh, but today's guest, this is long, long overdue. We've been chatting for a long, long time, but originally from Los Angeles, California, and now a highly versatile top call drummer in Nashville for about the last 15 years. Our friend Pete Abbott. What's <laughs> up, Pete? Thanks for being here, man. Thanks for having me, guys. It's uh, it's nice, hey, nice to be on the show. I've well, watched many episodes. Oh, cool! You're the guy. All right. Um, it's so cool. <laughs> it's so cool when I get uh, you know, little screenshots of um people's fireplaces and above their fireplace they have their nice little flat screen and they take a picture of Jim and I's grinning face with some sort of a cool guest and you're one of those cool guests. So thanks for being here, man. Thanks. There you go. Love very, it. very. Good yeah. Talking. Yeah. Well, I I love your story. I love the story. You, now you're saying mm -hmm. originally from the Los Angeles area, Pomona, Pomona, California. Yes, indeed. And how long were you there? Because you've lived in many musical cities. Yeah, you know my <clears throat> my dad was an aeronautical engineer, so he oh, worked wow. for General Dynamics. That's how we ended up out there. And then uh, we, I was there for, I guess until maybe I was six. And um, I've got a brother who is a fantastic guitar player. Unfortunately, he was born with asthma. And back in those days, L.A. had a serious, serious smog issue. It did. Yeah. So the doctor said, you, you got you to gotta get these guys out of here. And uh, so we ended up moving to Denver. So, I, I, you know, I wasn't there. I remember a little bit about it. The last time I was on the road, I went and found the house that we lived in. Pulled up, I was taking pictures. This guy comes out and he says, Hey man, can I help you? And I <laughs> told him told him the story. He invites me into the house. I sat there and had a cup of coffee with he and his wife and his daughter. And I, of course I didn't remember the inside of the house, but you know, it's it, it's interesting how friendly people are when they know that your intentions are good. Yeah, I was like, why is this person? Does he work for Google? Why is he taking a picture of my house here? Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's cool. That had to probably bring back some memories. Big time. Yeah. yeah now, as much as I could remember that, those were the early, early days. Yeah. What, yeah. Uh, when did you pick up a pair of sticks? Did you have other musical training? Like your mom forced you to, to play the piano or what? what's she the background? She didn't force us. Um, she was classically trained. Oh, nice. It was a certain degree. And then uh, she taught. So she got my brother and I into piano. So we started with piano. You know, and then your ear gravitates. You can, I was standing on a, a playground in fifth grade, the band was rehearsing. And I'm thinking, how the hell do those guys get notes to hold out on a snare drum? And I couldn't figure it out. One of the guys was a buddy and I said, hey, can I borrow your snare drum? And it, it kind of started with that. So then you like you figured out, oh, we got a, this. It's a press roll. It's a rhythm. And then we buzz the stroke or is just trial and error. You figured it out. Yeah, I'm sure I'm sure I drove my parents a little bit nuts. Just, you know, how, how do these guys do this? But you know, they were really supportive, both my brother and I. So they, as soon as we took off, I took off with drums. He took off with guitar. And uh, the lesson started. The Once we got a little bit older and we knew who people were, you know, um, uh, Maynard's band would come through town when Erskine was playing. Oh, yeah, Peter Erskine, Maynard Ferguson. Had got tickets and, you know, would take me, took Mike to see a bunch of stuff with 
different guitar players like Jim Hall. Yeah. Mike, Mike, he's a great, great jazz guitar player. I but, saw um, the Maynard band with Ray Brinker at a rock and roll nightclub in El Paso, Texas. My dad took me to see me at the cherry red Yamaha's and yeah. was just doing the, it was, you know, it must've been 83, 84. Yeah. Were hmm. any of the older guys still in the band? Like, I, didn't, uh, I didn't know the makeup of the band. I just know that I was wearing my shiny Zildjian jacket as all the kids did. And my dad took me to the nightclub because I couldn't get in. He's like, we got to go see this Maynard Ferguson. He took me to see Buddy Rich. He took, took me to see Chuck Berry. Yeah, he was great. It sounded like you had a similar similar parents. Oh, yeah. They 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 were all in. You know, I, I was never met with a, uh, well, you know, kid, you should, you should think about doing something that's going to offer you a little more stability. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's great to have supportive parents where you don't have to put on the gloves and have a fight. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure, man. You, you obviously had the same thing. Yeah, my parents what were like, hey, like, if you're passionate about it. Well, so, <laughs> yeah, my parents were like all in, like driving me to nightclubs, like, you know, and getting me the lessons and mm. sending me to college. And they're like, they're like, get straight A's, we'll pay for it. So, Jim, you're saying that your mom and dad were like, drums, what? My brother and I, my brother started playing piano at six or seven and always wanted to go on the road and, you know, try and live that life. But we were always told, well, you got to have something to fall back on. And I don't care what you want to do. You're going to college. Right. And uh, that was more important to them than what we wanted to do. So, yeah. Well, you always, yeah. you always say having the backup plan is not a good plan. Well, I mean, it's I, I'm, I'm a big believer believer and I spouse to my kids these days is understand who you are. You know, when you're, uh, you know, Cammy going off to college, Cammy's my oldest, yeah. uh, next year, she'll likely be going to college. And I tell her, look, um, your twenties are for falling on your face and figuring what out, what you truly want to do and who you are. If you want to go pursue music and go to college for music, then fine major in music, you know, and that back in, back in when we went to college, it wasn't as practical as I guess it could be now. So it, it was just not talked about yeah you know, i got the old or practical, was talked about it was it was frowned upon so i got the practical mm. music education degree i got i got two of those mm. now now pete you ended up at the university of miami right did you finish i did finish great i i, I was very very close to not finishing uh there was a guitar player down there randy Burnson, and randy had he had a deal on mca zebra records and it, I'll tell you what, if you want to find some cool records, you know, he he lived in Lauderdale. So he was very, I think he might might be the godfather to Jocko's kids. Oh, wow. There, there's a heavy connection to Jocko, you know, Bobby Thomas Jr., Othello Molino, all those guys lived down there. So some road work came up. And I wasn't going to be able to finish like the last semester. And I had the conversation with the parents and I don't remember what the catalyst was, but I decided to stay and finish. I think, I think I might have had the conversation with Whit Seidner who ran the program, who I just had a ton of respect for. And he, he kind of, he kind of laid it out and said, okay, if you do this, if you do this, and that school was so well connected to the New York um, establishment guys that come down, we get to meet them and play with them, you know, uh, Bobby Mincer, Randy Brecker, people like that. Yeah. And he just said, look, these opportunities are going to come along. You want to miss out on these things. And a little light bulb went on and much as I love playing with Randy. And it was a, an enormous experience to work with the guy. Cause I was really green back then. Yeah. I, I decided to stay. Good. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, I tell kids like, look at it. We know what you're going to do. You're going to go and you're going to try to set the world on fire, but you, you might, you're going to be 21, 22. When you finish, you might as well just finish. Cause most likely you're not going to go back. Most mm. likely. <laughs> yeah, most likely. I got to play with the same two people in college, Bob Mincer and Randy Brecker with the lab bands, you know, the yeah. at Texas tech. And then, at, and then at UNT. Um, so this really speaks to your versatility. Cause usually I'll, start off by saying some of the your accolades here you play with the average white band tom jones larry carlton keb mo phil ramon i love his story about cleaning the toilets and this recording studio worked his way up blood sweat and tears marion faithful bed midler 
uh, I mean, Paquito de Rivera, that's all over the map from jazz to smooth jazz to funk R&B, horn bands, country, uh, blues, fusion. What's the secret? How are you that versatile, man? Well, you know, I think it's one opportunity comes along. And, it, you know, the education at the University of Miami, you, you couldn't be in a better situation if you want to be a player and you want to learn how to play different styles of music. We had, you know, I went down there, uh, I don't know, a year and a half ago, um, just did a little class. And um, I think now there are, I'm probably exaggerating, but 30 small groups. Wow, that's a lot. So for, for each semester, so-and-so goes to one, so-and-so goes to the other, and then they mix them up. So the next semester, you'll go and you'll play in a different small group. It was the same with us. I mean, we had ECM Ensemble, Fusion Ensemble, Rock Ensemble. Andy Timmons was there when I was in school. And oh, of course, killer. Yeah, he just annihilated Rock Ensemble. And, uh, and it <clears throat> back then, you listened to music differently, Right. And a lot of the guys that you gravitated towards, they could do that. They could switch gears. And I mean, there's a, there are guys that can do it and they can really own it to a certain extent. And then there are guys like you wouldn't take uh, Clyde Stubblefield or Jabo and put them in, you know what I'm saying? You wouldn't put them in a different no. uh, idiom. And a big band. They do what they do, and they're yeah. so freaking great at it. It's like, no, <laughs> I can I can do that one one thing. I mean, one style of music. And uh, But back in those days, I mean, the record collection that I had, it was all over the map. Yeah. You know, and I love drummers like um, I ran in. I've only met Steve Gadd once, but I asked him about a record because I said, I don't know how you made this record. And then we started talking about, the different records that he had played on. And I started thinking about it and I went, man, talk about a guy that could really switch gears and he could make everything work. And he knew how to make a record. Which, which record was it? Chick Corea, the Mad Hatter. Oh, wow. Yeah. And it was so, it was so based around a little, um, a, a song, a little vignette that Chick had written but then the rest of it, it was totally off the cuff. And you know what it's like being in the studio. You know, it's one thing if you go in and record a pop song with a click track, but to be off the cuff and come up with that and have that kind of musicality and that type of groove and feel, it just, it knocked my socks off. I think I wore four copies of that record out. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, oh. you know, uh, Steve Gadd comes along every 20 years, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then I was in school with like a Keith Carlock and you're like, that guy comes along every 20 years, you know? So it's, and you recognize it right away. You're like, ah, I used to sub for Keith Carlock in Dallas, Texas with all his horn bands. And I'd be like, these are tough shoes to fill, but what am I going to do? It's apples and oranges. I'm, I can only do what I do, but you're like, this guy is going to change the world. Somebody is going to get a hold of him. And they did, you know, right away, Blues Brothers, um, what, what, what's the guy that he used to play with at the 55 bar like all the time gotcha. um yeah it just it just it just happened for him right away <laughs> yeah and Keith, you had mentioned you seen, you seen some of those clips of him at the forum with oh uh, yes Steve soloing on asia oh my right. god yeah the guys the guy's phenomenal he really <laughs> is He's really something more. you had mentioned rotating through the groups earlier in uh in college i guess right yeah uh, were those like stylistic differences that you kind of had to figure out? Yeah. You know? So they would, uh, you'd sit down with whoever was running the group stylistically. You'd pick anywhere between, say, two and five songs. And then we had a Friday forum. So maybe half to three quarters of the way through the semester, you had to perform those songs and come as close to um, being as honest with the style. And that went for all of the people that were in the group. So a lot, you so know, what was, go ahead. what was your most challenging style that you had to learn? Nice, Jim. ECM music. ECM. So, so Jim, ECM is a label, a jazz label. And they did, they had a lot of like the drummers would play like flat rides and be like, chicka ding, chicka ding, chicka ding, chicka ding, frost kind of stuff. Uh, Pat Metheny yeah, okay. would. Right? 
Yeah. Pat Metheny would have been the kind of like the poster child for that <laughs> style. Yes. Yeah. Pat and, you know, the uh, uh, Ralph Towner, uh, Keith Jarrett. Um, mm. There's a great record called Belonging. And, you know, that's well, maybe we'll get into it. But they're uh, the Norwegian drummer that worked with Jan Gabarik. Uh, his name was Jon Christensen. Yes, I remember him. Yeah. Yeah. Do you ever hear the story about him coming over to sub for Dijonette? No, Jack Dijonette. I love to hear this. So you spent time in Oslo, right? Did you ever, did, did he pass or did you get to meet he, this? He did. He passed, but ah. I happily say, and I will tell, <laughs> I'll divulge it. I rehearsed at a rehearsal studio and they had three of Jon's symbols. And this was before he passed away. And they're so, you can't find these symbols anymore. So he was nice enough. He sold me one of them. I paid Made him a nice chunk of change for it. Woo. You know? That's and, a piece of, of musical history that you have. It, it's guarded. Wow. Yeah. I've got a special dog. Keeps an eye on it. Man. Yeah, it's, it's in a, a safe deposit box in <clears throat> Norway. <laughs> no, it's here. It's, I, it's here. I, I right. use yeah. it every now and then. Nice. But nice. yeah, it's a, it's a great symbol. So, but that's a challenging style in the sense that, I'm trying to think it. It's 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 linear and it's just sheets of sound and it's just complete improvisation. So and it's more straight eighth as opposed to spang spagading. Right. The bass rhythm is usually more straight eighth and then broken up between the limbs constantly. So it's pretty pretty challenging. Very long phrases. You know that that I think was the most difficult thing for drummers to understand. It's like you listen to Dijonette's probably the the prime example, some of those old records, there was a, uh, an Abercrombie record, I think it was called Timeless. And um, you listen top to the bottom of the song and it, it's just one big long phrase. You know, you're not landing every four, eight, 16 bars. It's, it's learning how to disguise one, how to, how, how to articulate the arrangement of the song in a subtle way so that you're not beating people over the head. With the one, yeah. It would not work with, uh, say, a drummer who played in the um, Parliament Funkadelic because it's all about the one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We got the one. Bang. I mean, it's like, but this, Jim, there is no one for like 32 measures. It's just like. Yeah, we're dancing. talking about stretching yourself, man. Totally. That, that's like for me, the jazz stylings and the Cuban, the, the, the those types of stylings, salsa. They just bake my brain. My yeah. gosh, you know, claves and things of that nature. I've tried them before, and it's you know probably just got to commit to it of doing it over and over and over again, immersing yourself into the actual music and the style, and getting around people that play it. You know, for probably months, if not years, on end. I mean, yeah. when do you you know playing a style like that? When do you feel like? I guess it's all subjective. When do you feel that you've got a handle on it? Like for you. Well, Miami was a great school for Latin music for obvious reasons. Yeah. The, the oh, community. Yeah. So much culture. Yeah. When I, when I finally got into the Wits band, which was the top band, uh, the percussionist that was, I, I don't think I worked with him, but his name was Hector Nessius up and he was Alex Acuna's nephew. Oh, wow. So you're, he, Wit was smart enough. He brought in percussionists that really, they, they grew up with the music. So to really own it, you really have to grow up because it's a language. And if you understand the language and um, what separates, you know, you have four different types of claves. If you don't know what makes each clave, what bell pattern goes with each clave. You are fired. Um, you're fired or killed. You're fired. I mean, yeah, they, they, they will about, actually, yeah, they, you know, talk about that 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 latin you know there's a little bit of like you know i played in cumbia bands and stuff in el paso texas and there's there is a serious machismo that happens from playing that uh, instrument and you get the look and you're just like uh oh yeah yeah well you guys know who sammy figueroa is right yeah yeah mm -hmm. so sammy told me one time about some place down in cuba where and i I'm hoping I'm remembering this correctly, but it struck me as like, oh my God, okay, they really take this to your point very seriously. <laughs> and some guy flipped the clave in the middle of the song, and I don't know if Sammy was joking. He said, "Man, they took him and took him out back behind the club and let him have it." <laughs> and I, <laughs> they I don't beat mean him senseless, like an Italian yeah. mob movie. Yeah, 
Yeah, to the point of oh, I'm never <laughs> going back in there again. Holy cow. It's a, you yeah, respect it's the club, eh, man? Yeah, yeah. You got to yeah. do it. Say hello to my little friends. <laughs> but, you know, it's a, it's the same with any idiom of music. You listen to just great. Um, Bill Stewart's a great example. Yeah. One of the best jazz drummers around. And he knows the language. I mean, he's done all of his homework. He, so he can break the rules. Yeah. Yeah. And he yeah. did. It, he does it all match grip. You know, when I was coming up, I, you know, I was taught by a rock drummer and uh, in 1976, and I never learned traditional grip. I was like, I just never. That's it. This works for marimba. It works for glockenspiel. Works for everything. So I was like, see, it can be done. This guy is killing it. Match grip brushes. He's he's great, man. I love listening to him. It's incredible. Yeah. It really, really is. I have to play traditional when I do brushes. Yeah. Just you, you get the feel. Yeah. Know? Yeah, Jim. I, I've never seen you pick up a pair of brushes. It's a lost art You barely see me play. Well, I, mean, I know, but every my, time you my, do play, it's great. Jim has got a natural feel, like a natural instinct. It's good. I'm so rusty, though. It is pathetic. I, I have not picked that. It's been, it's like, I'll, I'll dare say that I've been playing drums for 35 years, but I'm like, in reality, it might, it maybe is 10. <laughs> You know? <laughs> yeah, it so. is such a physical instrument. Mm. But, you know, you can do so much yeah. practicing just mentally. You know, I mean, it's like as we get older and there's yeah. more on our plate, I, that's what I – half the battle is just listening and just – I don't know if that's the same for you. Yeah, it's it's listening and, uh, you know, I'll go through stages where I practice, but I don't – you get older, you get on to other things, you realize that uh, um, I, I never was a big chops guy. Yeah. I love music. Yeah. I love listening to drummers that uh, when you listen to the song, you go, okay, this guy, he couldn't have played it any more perfect than he did. Yeah. You know, Keltner's a great example of that. Sure. And, you know, I've been immersing myself. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. All I was going to say is, you know, Jim plays things. They're, they're very subtle. I've heard people talk about him, which I'm not surprised it, it blows my mind in one way, but I'm not surprised that people will go, uh, he didn't do anything that great or he didn't do anything that fancy. And they can be listening to, to something like uh, down in Hollywood off of Ry Cooter's Bop Till You Drop record. And it's one of the funkiest tracks you'll ever hear. It is so, the feel is so perfect. And they, I'll tell you what, it's harder to do that than to go and watch some chopsy video learn a lick and play the lick a lot of those guys yeah, i don't want to go there because i don't i don't know them and i don't want to judge them but it's to to play simpler and have it be that effective and that right it is not easy to do that no and that's what nashville taught, that's what nashville taught me i mean jim and jim and i talk about it all the time it's like you know we're in college and we learn how to play super dense and because, you know, Ed Sof told me, he goes, you don't want somebody going like this saying, give me more. And you're at the peak of your technique. You want to be able to go there if they want that. But even more uh, challenging is the discipline to have chops and not use them, which is 98 percent of our job. So the 25 years in Nashville taught me like, hey, kid, you know, it's in the back pocket there. You know, you got to. You got a good dub, double stroke roll. You could put it in between your Spock boom, babo dooms, but the Spock boom, babo dooms is, is the expectation, you know? I guess, I guess that language is the same as the big Bob McAdoo, right? Big mop back. or uh, yeah. yeah. Pat boom, Debbie boom. I love the phrasings that they come. You got the verbalization. Yeah. So, so, Jim, what were you going to say? Debbie Boone. Yeah. No, now, I was going to say that, you know, with all the varieties, especially, you know, want to make your living as a drummer, uh, you know, and I always bring this up when I saw the the drumming in the modern world videos that Rich did you know, years ago, the styles that Rich could play, like the, uh, the, the straight ahead jazz, the New Orleans influences, things of that nature. It was amazing to see how natural you kind of gravitated towards it. Is there a requirement that you got to, you know, is that, is it like riding a bike? Can you just pick up and go? Or do you have to, you know, every now and then spend a week or two weeks just, okay, I need to, I need to focus on my Cuban feels, my, my jazz feels, this kind of, all the different derivations just to, in case it's called upon to make sure you got those, 
those chops are brushed up. Cause I mean, in my case, I've, you know, I'm, I'm starting to get back into it. I'm playing, I've, I've immersed myself into Huey Lewis in the news. I've, I just love the music and Bill Gibson is such an underrated drummer. Um, you know, in, in the song, uh, stuck with you, there's an eight, uh, an eighth note shuffle. It is a, it is a tough beat to keep up, man. You should see keep Pete's, right shuffle. Going like that. Pete's got this yeah. double shuffle. You can look him up on the two, the YouTubes and he's playing it like around town with like Kenny Vaughn and, you know, Dave Rowe, God rest his soul. And it's, you can't, you can teach a shuffle the physicality of what it is, but you can't teach a shuffle right. the feel of it you've right? got to just get yelled at on the bandstand and get the stink <laughs> guy and so for a shuffle that good you had to get the mm -hmm. stink guy a lot maybe not maybe yeah. it's just it's in your dna but you got a wicked shuffle i i think you have to uh you know what i used to do when i was younger is if if a, a groove came up i'd I'd talk to people and I'd go, man, who plays, who plays the absolute shit out of this groove? Earl Palmer, for example, right? I mean, there's, there's a legendary guy that, I mean. <laughs> he brought can't. the straight eighths to rock that, you know? Yeah. You know, it's a, uh, um, but you put on a record and you listen to it and, and you hear what all of the other things that are going on. And then it starts to make sense why he played the way that he played. And and then you go, okay, I need to learn how to do this. Hmm. And, the, and the best thing, that's one of the best ways to practice is sit with the, kind of get an ear for it, put a click on, not that you have to sit there and bury a click track, but just as a guide so that you know that your time is staying steady. And don't play, I mean, take a kick, snare, hat, maybe a ride cymbal, don't play any fills and just sit there and play that groove again and again and again come back the next day and do it again then when you have a chance to play with a group it starts to take shape but it's not something that mm. immediately happens it it's a developmental process unless you're just a freak of nature and i don't i don't know too many of those guys i know a couple <laughs> yeah you there's know, well with the shuffle it. it's just a different thing there's just less space between that da, 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 and there's so many is it a gang get ink or is it good is it you know is it is it rounded does it have sharp edges what is the band leader like you know all the there's so much room for variation in a shuffle more than i feel like straight eights so that's why it's almost like like brushes it's kind of like a becoming a lost art form because when's the last time you heard a top 40 country rock or pop shuffle there's no more bad Leroy Browns, you know right. what I mean? There's no more Rosannas. It just doesn't exist. Yeah, I mean, mm. there aren't any more Ray Price shuffles as far as I know, right? Yeah. You know, I haven't heard any lately, but yeah. It's, it's hardly any train beats anymore. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, well, it's gone to the pop world. Yeah. Yeah. Duka, so, jacka, duka, jacka, duka. But, you know, you can take, I mean, when I started working with Jim Oblon, he's, he's a big Jimmy Reed fanatic. Yeah. And so I started hawking Jimmy Reed records and I was like, okay, why he's playing a certain way. And sometimes we get, we start doing a gig and he goes, man, can you, can you make it a tighter shuffle or can you make it a looser shuffle? And sometimes there was a reference he did. He made, Jim made this wonderful record with uh, Larry Goldings and uh, Keltner. Yikes. Wow. It's just the three of them. And it is, I love the record. And it's great to go and work with a guy like that where you have, a reference of that stature and you go, okay, I get it. That's, that's how this song needs to be played. So it all comes down. If you have a reference point and you can hear it, that's the first thing you take in the information and then physically you have to get so you can play it. But same in the jazz world. I mean, the difference in say Elvin Jones to Jimmy Cobb, you know, we know the difference in their ride symbol patterns. So there are so many subtleties in drumming that are, um, they take precedence to to any of the other stuff because that's the whole feel to the song. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, man. I, what, I, what was your process I, of like recording yourself? Would you listen back? Because it's tough to play it and understand if you're getting it. It's, uh, you know, doing a live performance and seeing the playback of it and going, 
oh my gosh, is that how I sound? Is that something that you would put into your practice routine? Would you have, because I know Rich, you played in front of a mirror to watch yourself and see mm -hmm. how you looked and everything. You, you took it to the nth degree back in the day where it's happening on a regular basis now with a lot of these, you know, TikTok and Instagram drummers. Um, but back in the day, I never did that as a player. I just played, you know, um, is that something that is necessary, especially if you want to take it to a professional level to listen to how you're, you're performing even by yourself. Was that for me or for rich? Oh, for you. Yeah. For you. Yeah. 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 You, you take it, Pete. <laughs> um, well, ch chime in if you want to, I can't watch myself. I'm one of these guys. It's like, there's a reason why I like sitting in the background. You know, Rich, Rich is very extroverted, and it's it's great. You know, I, mm. I, it's a it's something I'm not comfortable doing. I would be happy if there's no light. I can sit in the background. I would be able to hear all the other people, and it would just be based on my contribution in a in an audio environment. Amazing, and and it's uh you know everybody's personality is different. Yeah. I. I I didn't grow up or was put on earth to be a front man. You know, I think that's a lot of the reason why I chose drums. Now there's some real animated drummers. Fantastic. I love it. They're really a lot more fun to watch than I am, yeah. but you got to be comfortable in your, you know, you sit behind that kit. If you're not comfortable and you don't have that joy for playing music, no matter what music you're playing, it's not going to go well. I saw this interview with Tal Wilkenfeld, and she she was being asked questions about when she worked with Jeff Beck, and that was, you know, the Crossroads concert with Vinny. And you can see her. I mean, she is she's she's just comfortable. And that bass solo that she plays, you know, you can you can listen to it two, three, four times, and you can sing that bass solo. Ooh, it's it's hair raising. But she she made that point. She's like. If you get up and you play music and you have any amount of fear that you feel like you have to play something perfectly, you're not going to play music, you know, because mm. perfection is not what music is about. It's about communication right. and expression. Yeah, exactly. It's like the, the musician's buddy said it. He said he, he was asked, you know, why, why do you hire the guys that you hire? And he said, because they're the players that, emote the most expression and make the band sound the best amazing and, and yeah, as a drummer it's our job to get into the band situation and tell the rest of the guys what the deal is and drive them and say and make sure they're listening to you and you don't listen to anybody else just make sure that you're laying down your own personality you mean like buddy rich right yeah no yeah. i was actually referring back to when you and i we had dinner at your house rich and uh you and i kind of riffed a little bit and you're like you're really good man but you just gotta listen i'm like oh, okay that's a good point that, what did i say that yeah, from because well. <laughs> you're, you're like really mad at me you're like throwing things across the room and uh, oh yeah you know, i gave you a real whiplash that. treatment that's my teaching that's style right. is, the, is that whiplash did you ever have a whiplash <laughs> teacher Pete? i didn't you know uh wait you're down at Miami, he had a cowbell that he'd pull out every now and then, and he'd stand in the middle of the rhythm section and he he'd chunk out quarter notes if he felt like things were dragging or speeding up. But it's uh, if you're aware that somebody's going to do that, you, know, you get your ass in the practice room and make sure that that's not going to happen. Yeah, yeah so you've never had somebody that. throwing like like furniture across a room. I mean, that's pretty like that's that pretty that extreme. I I mean I I, no. I I mean I personally had some some uh teachers with high expectations and there was a little bit of fear but that a certain amount of that i think is okay but no no furniture mm. no furniture no, it's militaristic yeah, it's militaristic yeah. yeah but you know um so so pete you've lived in so many cities the la denver you were in miami you went up to new york and you live this is crazy oslo when i think of oslo I think of the um, I think of the Oslo airport, and there's that gigantic sculpture of all those naked people intertwined with each other. Have you ever have you been back recently? Sloats Parkin. <laughs> yeah, it's a uh, it's like whoa, okay, this is going to be a crazy city. Um, tell, what was that all? About? What was your European experience like, and how did you end up there? Uh, that happened 
night towards the end of 1998 and um it it was sort of a weird combination of events i started having uh hearing issues and i think I, i'm i'm pretty certain that the that what i was struggling with my with my hearing it was like pretty bad tinnitus tinnitus however you want to pronounce it and then what they called labyrinthitis and it's an inner ear disturbance and they can't treat it oh man so That'd what be they frightening. do is, yeah they assess your lifestyle you know how are you living are you sleeping are you drinking too much are you eating good food are you all of the things that can torque your nervous system sure and and basically um once I finally had an audiologist over in Scotland and he said, usually what people have to do, they have to give up their environment for six months to a year. And I'd met mm. a Norwegian woman. We got along great. And one thing led to the no another. And then the next thing I knew I was getting married and I was moving to Oslo. And I just thought, I'd like to live somewhere else. Let's see what this is like. Mm. It's a great experience. Um, it's always a it woman. What'd you say? It's always a woman. You know, if you go over to Oslo and as you, if you walk down the street, every American male that you meet, that's hundred percent of the time. Why do you live here? Well, I met this woman. Why do you live here? I met this great looking woman. Why? Amazing. You know, you go over there. It's like every, every corner, your, your neck is getting a little stiffer because you can't keep your eyes going down the road. The it's things a, we'll do for pursuing a female relationship yes yeah well it's a beautiful it's thing um but it you know i had a friend that i went to school with and um i got in touch with him and after i don't know maybe a a year and a half i started playing again and i had some gear over there and then um the guitar player his name is george Medanius, uh kill a musician um he played on all the mid 80s uh luther vandross a uh, bunch oh. of the roberta flack he was in the uh saturday night live band oh, kill uh, and that's when marcus and buddy were doing it buddy williams buddy williams yeah and um yeah he's he's just a monstrous musician great guy and he became a became a really close friend and we started the three of us started working in certain in a studio that his name is the other guy's life Johansson and um and we started working together different projects would come in so the marriage didn't last and that's not surprising because you grew up in so much such different environments and um you know no ill feelings we were we agreed on yeah it's it's not going to go much further than this but um the work that I ended up getting, um, there is a drummer everybody should know about that lives over in Sweden. And maybe you have heard of him. His name is Per Lindvall. Wow. Okay. And not many drummers I've heard at this level. He He's astounding. And when, when there's a record being done over there, he's usually the first call guy. Amazing. And he, he grew up in a situation he doesn't like if if you talk to him and i haven't spent a ton of time with pear but there were gigs that he would do and then the artist would call me and i would sub for him so i got to listen to all the stuff that he played on the records and he's one of those guys where you listen to track and you go couldn't have done anything better and the pocket is just you know greg bissonette don't you oh yeah yeah i, I oh, no. greg showed had up him on yeah oh did you i think mm -hmm. uh i think i met him through life and i mentioned pear's name and and uh i think greg knew about him but greg was like oh yeah i did two months worth of lessons with the guy he's great you know I mean, <laughs> greg greg was my career path model like prepare to play anything and then be open to playing anything and see where the universe takes you great concept isn't it right yeah yeah man yeah. So this guy is like the Vinny of Sweden. Yeah, and it's not it's not so much um I, you know his pocket when Michael Ruff used Michael Ruff used to go over and he would hire pair and this 
bass player, uh, Lars Danielson from Denmark. And um, those two guys together, it doesn't get any better. Incredible. It's, it's extreme. And um, it's just the way they approach music. And sometimes Peter will, he'll play something and you go, what the hell was that? I mean, it, it's great. It's in a good way. And sometimes you can't figure out what he's doing. I mean, he's, it, the way I understand it from George is, if you ask him, he'll go, I don't know. <laughs> Joe, George put a record together and there's some odd time stuff on there. And I said, how did Pear learn this stuff? And he said, I just played it for him and he knew how to play it. So that, that thing, like what we were talking about before, you know, you just, you, you can't do that the same way people like that can do it. Cause it's just intuitive and it's their ear telling them exactly what to play in that moment. And they're in a state of flow and they don't get in their own way. Yeah. And um, it's great, how, man. It, it how did you learn the language? Long. How did that, did you, I'm sure you had to learn the language, right? And then later in life, our brains are like, you know, they say you can't learn a language past age five or seven, you know? No, nah, that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> but it's easier to learn it when you're younger. Yeah. But the, uh, or when you're yeah. immersed in it every day too. Sure. Right. Well, you know, the pull of meeting a woman, she's, you know, you're getting along with her, she's attractive, and you're like, ah, I better learn the language. So I kind of started on my own, and when I got over there, I went to uh, I went to a school for two or three months, but I didn't have time to continue because I had to work a job, and yeah. um, but I would go out and I'd hear people talking, and I started getting paranoid because I didn't know what they were saying, and I didn't know if they were talking about me. Mm. so that's good incentive to learn the language yeah just being thrown into the deep end of the pool yeah Yeah. just the deep end man because my dad is an el gringo and he he did business in el paso for 20 years and he spoke very nice conversational business spanish and you know he would there was many situations where people were talking around him and they're like this surely this guy this gringo does not speak and he would he, he would just like i know everything you're saying guys you can't get it <laughs> nice. past me yeah yeah uh, i got my hair cut yesterday i'm positive they were talking about me where do you go jim that they don't speak the language uh luis barber yeah you go to a traditional bar yeah they- yeah, traditional barber. Go get the shave, got the beard trimmed up and everything nice. squared off. They don't the have all the state-of-the-art products and spiking and all that kind of stuff, the overpriced stuff on pay. It's yeah. old school, man. It, yeah. It's, it's you know, it's a chain, but it has that feel of old school barbershop, you know. Yeah. And they're just talking around me, and I'm like, they're totally making fun of me right now. Oh, my God. I would hate to know the nope. amount of money I have spent on my hair over the years. Anyways. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's like so, that episode of Seinfeld, right, where they're. Aren't they in a, they're getting mani pedis or something or yeah. Elaine's yeah. and the women are talking and she doesn't know what's going on. Yeah, I'm, do, I'm due for my Manny. Like I, I'll do it twice a month, man. I, you know, it's worth every penny, you know, cause you, 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 you just, there's nothing like a fresh haircut and a fresh Manny. You just are ready to take on the world. Yeah. Yeah. I get it. <laughs> so do you get manicures, Pete? No, no, not, I've never done no. it. I, uh, maybe one day we'll see. Oh yeah. yeah. Treat yourself. Treat yourself. Yeah. Manny Petty for that you get Manny's and Petty's Rich? Uh more Manny's and then, you know, like less Petties. But uh, occasionally you'll make a David, you know, you go to the place where they give you like a glass of Chardonnay, pinkies out, and you do the thing, you know, and you get you get uh you get pampered. You're living large. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so Pete, do you have your man do you have your man card on you that we could take right now or do we wait till after the episode? Ouch, buddy. This well, you know, it's good, but there needs to be a little comedy in these things, <laughs> dude. Average white band. You you did a couple of records with them. You toured with them from ninety four to ninety eight along the same lines, blood, sweat, and tears. Um, my buddy, you might know him, New York City drummer. We went to school together. Brian Delaney. He played with Blood, Sweat, and Tears in like 2000, 1999, around that era. Um, okay. I don't know if you know Brian, but two great gigs right there, man. That had to be a great experience. Tell us about that, man. You know, Blood, Sweat, and Tears came, um, um, a, a good friend of mine, Graham Hawthorne, great drummer, he was a little older than I was, so he moved to New York. When I moved to New York, this is a great way to get work. 
if you have somebody that's a little bit older than you, then you go to where they are, at least back in those days when the gigs existed. And Graham had me sub for him on Blood, Sweat, and Tears dates. Nice. And he mm. quit Blood, Sweat, and Tears, and he was working with, remember Noel Pointer? Yeah. And then I started working with Noel, and it was just this sort of rolling effect of, all right, Graham, you know, when, when's the next one coming on? And and um, he was great. He threw me a lot of work. And, um, you know, Blood, Sweat, and Tears, um, the guys in the band were great. Yeah. Clayton was difficult, and that's how I ended up quitting the gig. He, oh, is he a difficult, one of the difficult guys? Yeah. <laughs> is, it, is it like micromanaging tempos? No, you know, the, the, the big event, we were in Laughlin, Nevada, playing a show outside, and there was, no, there was no opportunity for me to rehearse with the band. I hadn't done a gig with them in a, in a while. They changed some of the arrangements. They oh. added some horn sections that were rubato. And and the musical director, he said, you have to use charts. Now, the, the way the story goes is that David, back in the day, Jocko sat in with the band, played the shit out of however many songs, didn't have music. So he will not allow music on the bandstand, maybe for the horn player, but not for the rhythm section. Oh, the horn players always yeah. got to have their charts. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, wind's blowing. I've got all of the music taped to the monitor so I can just rip one back the next time, you know, we're moving on to the next song. Cool. This mic starts feeding back and he starts walking around the stage and the the uh, trumpet player, musical director, he's looking at me. He's going, uh-oh, this isn't good. Clayton comes over and he yanks all the charts off of the monitor, heaves them up in the air. And they start floating around and we're just kind of, and the musical director looked at me and goes, good luck. <laughs> Damn it. It's just, it's just those kinds Time of things. Time to milk it in. I mean, it yeah. could be a joyful experience. Like, you know, that's, that's music should be, it shouldn't be that hard. No, no. And you know, there were other things that went along with that. I won't get into it, but sure. uh, I just, with the, you know, we'd fly out of Newark at, six o'clock in the morning and uh -huh. then you you'd have like a four hour drive because of traffic in la to go to the pomona state fairground right where you're Play from yeah yeah and then you're back at the airport and then they would book these flights going back where there was a stop it was not a direct flight and then in the middle of the night in the middle of the night that's horrible Stop in Cleveland, be in Cleveland for an hour and a half, and then you'd get into Newark Airport at about eleven o'clock the next morning, and you were toast for the next two to three days. Yeah, there was like a that's a twenty something hour day for whatever the day rate was at the time. Yeah, well, their day rate at the time was about two hundred and seventy five bucks. Oh no, that is because I, I remember like Steve Houghton one time was like, I had no idea you could play big band like that. I Maynard needed a new drummer. I should have like. This was like around 94 and 95, but it paid 300 bucks a week. Mm -hmm. I was like, everybody wants this gig on their resume, but even for a 25 year old musician, $300 a week is not a lot. No. Yeah. So, How did it go with the Ray Charles's guys again? I think they made 400 a week, but they had to pay for their own hotel rooms. Ouch. That leaves you with nothing. What are you eating? Yeah. I don't know. Dirt. <laughs> but everybody but ray knew he had him over a barrel because he's like everybody wants to work with ray charles so there you go so but please tell me that the average white band was a better working scenario the average white band was uh probably probably the best musical experience love it for me and it it has to do i love the music um always did always will those songs do not get old um but the other part of it is uh those guys when i got into the band there were three originals uh alan gory who lead singer along with hamish when the two of them were in the band and alan um uh, bass guitar he, he is an extremely great musician Ani mcintyre great rhythm guitar player and Roger Ball, who Roger wrote the melody to pick up the pieces. 
And, um, uh, you know, I got along with everybody great. It was like a family. And, and uh, it was tough to leave the band. It was a difficult situation. Very hard conversation to have with Alan because he and I, we're still really close. We get along great. And great. Um, I've got the utmost respect for him because he's been the one that's kept that band running all of these years. I mean, yeah. he, his energy level and his ability to do both the creative and the practical, you know, it, I don't know too many people that can do that. Yeah. And then show up and play the shit out of the gig and sing on that level. So um, I loved it. You know, yeah. I, I can look back at it and go, well, maybe I shouldn't have made the decision that I did. But I, I think my body kind of made it for me. And it was just out of necessity that I had to give it a break. Um, they've had some killing drummers since, you know. Yeah, Adam, so this would uh, well actually Brian would have probably come right after you because if you were there till 98, he was like I said 90 99 2000. That was right during my first job here in Nashville with Pam Tillis and we ended up doing a state fair or something on the East Coast together and I was and I, I ran into him I was well he what did he he called me, "Hey man, we're playing the same gig man we're doing the same show we're coming on before you but of course i was at the hotel with the band so i didn't get to see him do the gig but it would have he would have been right after you probably but but he was doing blood sweat and tears right yeah and i was yeah, doing pam tilla so. do yeah. yeah um but and you know it's weird alan called about let's see it was right around covid huh. and um the drummer this, this guy that has been doing the gig and holding the chair down for, I don't know, 13 to 15 years. Rocky Bryant is his name. And oh, yeah, the um, Cindy Lauper guy. Uh, I guess. I know him from Sanborn, and he's done a lot of great gigs. Wick, wickedly good drummer. And he was the guy that they hired to do the uh, Tina Turner Broadway musical. Nice. And it was a great gig. I mean, any in-town Broadway, you know, you're – your uh your pay your you know every everything that has to do with lifestyle when you have an in-town gig like that it's good and got a couple of kids so i came back in and i did the stuff that rocky couldn't do right so i got to come back in and work with the guys and hang with them and and um i don't know what their plans are as of right now but <clears throat> it's uh you, you feel lucky when you have an opportunity to revisit it and both Ani and alan are in the band and you know it's how does the saying go it's 80 percent hang 20 percent playing yeah the, the playing is the expectation mm -hmm. well you know the playing is the expectation and then the the the, the icebreaker or the thing that determines everything is is the hang yeah 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 you got to be able to hang but yeah they're they're like family for me that's great and i've got scottish blood maybe there's something into the way that we get along but uh it's uh yeah it was it was fantastic uh, experience for me awesome we've got to pipe it down um so what was that uh, educational uh institution that you were at here in nashville that you i almost came out and did a thing with you yeah that was called segway 61 and that was the brainchild of a uh, i'm pretty sure it was kind of the brainchild of one guy over in north carolina and it ran for two semesters. The tough thing, wow. we couldn't mark, I mean, two years. So it was two semesters each year. But you can imagine um, parents or whoever's providing the financing for a kid to come to a program like that. It wasn't a program for somebody to come and sit in a room and shed. It was a program. It was a practical program. So we ran it out of a recording studio and yeah. a... Uh, sort of a, a music business type of a of an environment and and we had all kinds of yeah it's too bad we I, I don't you were probably on the road is my guess and that was the tough tough thing yeah. to hook and pop. but you know I had um, those kids got exposed to a lot of people uh, both in a I'd have players come in of the Michael Rhodes and you know, it's funny. These guys are like, oh, I'm not a teacher. I don't know what to do. And I said, it's not about that. It's about you coming in. There'll be three charts on your stand, just like doing a session. And the students get to run the session. Oh, nice. So they start to learn 
how do I communicate? How do I know when to shut up and let the musician do what is instinctual to that person? Um, when do I say, hey, that's great. Could you try doing it this way? You know, because kids, I remember when I was that age, I'd, I'd probably be timid as hell. But it, you know, it was great. And I still keep in touch with a lot of the kids that went to the program, but we couldn't market it. Yeah. You're trying to convince people that they need to spend another 20 grand on their on their kids' education after they've been to college. Ah, interesting. That was the kicker. And the, the students that would come from out of town, then you have the living expenses as well, because we did not have, there wasn't a campus per se. Yeah, it's like when I when, I, when the kids go to like MI in the heart, the heart of Hollywood, I'm thinking to myself, where, and these kids are from out, out of town or out of the country, a lot of out of actually a lot of out of the country students at Musicians Institute. Where are they living? You know, because I don't think there's a dorm program, so they and then they have to pay that high LA rent. Yeah, you know, and that so, or, the original concept for that program, they wanted to run it out of the old. Uh, what was the studio? Was that a, the record plant in Sausalito? Yeah, and you can imagine what the living expenses would oh have been. Oh my God! There. Yeah, and that's what that's what shut it down there. Plus the the administration that handled all of the administrative duties, they, they're in North Carolina, so it was too far. Well, that's a shame, but in, is that important to you? You know, as a music education, the power of music education, or uh, do you want to have your hand in teaching like at all times in your, in your career? Are you teaching now? I'm not teaching now. I've got a couple of guys that'll, you know, they're like, can, can I pick your brain or, you know, I don't, and, but they're not necessarily, it's not, hey, can we sit with two kids? Yeah. You know, well, we get the picking brain thing a lot. You know what I mean? We yeah. drink a lot of coffee, don't we, Jim? I bet do. you do. You know, yeah. you want to, people that move to this environment, I don't, I don't think they, they don't have a clue. I mean, they have to have people that they can sure. sit that will tell them, hey, here are the do's, here are the don'ts. Don't go up and ask somebody that's high up on the register. Don't say, hey, can you, throw me a bone can you throw me a gig because everybody that's here that's one of the first things that i learned when i moved here i don't know if you got the same thing but um you know michael rhodes and i became really close friends yeah. um i was lucky enough to get to work with him a certain bit and um um but you're not gonna as a drummer you're not gonna move this town with guys like greg morrow and chad cromwell and chris McHugh uh shannon for i mean there are some wickedly great drummers here that are yeah. have been ensconced in the studio scene and playing live and and um but he and i we became like brothers we'd hang out all the time and talk and that was one of the things he told me like he'd get a call from somebody and bass player and go hey can you throw me a gig and he's like dude wrong question to ask i had to earn it you earn it you know get out there meet the people you need to meet and and start someplace <laughs> and you throw me a gig oh man yeah well i yeah. mean i mean before i moved to nashville i sent lonnie and eddie my demo and they were so sweet they both listened to it and they were like geez kid you're covering a lot of bases here you'll probably do well you just gotta like uh get involved like just start shaking trees become part of the community support the community the community will support you and uh it took some time but um um Lonnie I think gave me like a little road gig like right away you know the um 3 weeks on the road five sets a night you crash at the band house it wasn't glamorous you know it wasn't what I was looking for but I went and did it and I was happy to have it and I was so grateful he, he did that to me and I I remember I remember that how poignant that was and so like god if I can help anybody and they're great oh my god I I'm happy to do it Yeah you know just Giving, giving them support and saying, hey, look, you know, you're going to have to earn your own way. But there, there are ways to to get yourself, you know, that that's the one thing I think that's daunting for people. And it's easy for them to forget. You have to start somewhere. Couldn't be with one person. Go meet some drummers. Hey, if you ever need a sub. I mean, it's very obvious little 
little tidbits of information that you're giving them, but they're they're seeing this big community. They're hearing all these great players. I did a gig one time, and the the guitar player was Cat, the girl that played with Prince. Oh wow! And she she got here. It's one of the sweetest human beings, great guitar player. She was nervous, and I'm thinking, well, and we spoke. I said, "Why are you nervous?" She goes, "Because of the." The fact that Nashville has the best guitar players. She goes, I don't know who's going to be here. And I'm actually nervous to play in front of an audience that could hold four or five of Nashville's best guitar players. Wow. I guess Nashville is interesting there around the States. <laughs> yeah. It, well, it, 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 it still is a guitar town and it's always been known as a guitar town, but man, has it become drum town? I mean, you know, we're talking yeah. like, you know, M I U N T U S C Miami. The kids are coming here. Well, and I mean, what do you think about, or both of you? You know, the level of some of these kids and what they can do, just based on what's available to them, without them having to pay much money or any money for for getting that information and and being exposed to. They sit in a practice room all day and they come out. I've heard some of these kids playing. It's like, good God, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't touch that when I was their age. Well, they have YouTube yeah. University, which is incredible. And they got the great slower downer and they got Moises and they've got all these little tools and applications, which is, um, I don't want to be like, get off my lawn guy. But I mean, those are, that's a great advantage. And then also, you know, we love to go through the dusty record bins and, you know, the green dot means it's two dollars and ninety cents. The blue dot means it's three dollars and ninety. And we go and we get our little record collection and we drop the needle. Now you could just go and you want to learn and you want to learn the style of Motown. Boom! You pull up the greatest hits, the hundred greatest Motown songs. They're all in order. You pull up your headphones. You play with the shit. It's like it's easier. Yeah. And not only that, you do a search on uh, YouTube on how to play the basics and the fundamentals of that style of music. There's you know, thousands of guys out there that have done it and uh, put out instructional tutorial videos on that. Um, the only thing that I would say that the kids are missing are probably the human element of playing with them. Yeah. Playing that, that's exactly right. Yeah. You know, the kids that aren't missing that are usually the ones that are spending a lot of their time in the churches. People because, they're, them. you know, they're, they're it's all about. Good, and they do get to play. They right. get to play with people and they do. I've seen it gone to a couple of places and and uh, just been sort of a fly on the wall and the older the older cats they're really good for the kids you know they're like hey man you're playing too much be cool yeah yeah church is, church is a great no, uh, training ground it really is i mean yeah, you know no matter what kind of church it is i remember when i moved here in 97 i started calling all the churches because i was playing in all those charismatic you know Robert Tilton churches in Dallas with a giant band. And it was like, here's your 200 bucks, kid. You know, I, I could make 200 bucks on a Sunday. And so I started trying to get a church gig here in Nashville. And they're like, honey, we don't pay our musicians here in Nashville for church. And I was like, got it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's not quite the same as the south side of Chicago, is it? Yeah, oh I got But I mean, it, at that point, would you suggest to somebody coming to town, even though it doesn't pay? That's an element of networking that you can, you know, start getting to know other musicians. They get a feel of what it's like to play with you. Sure. You know, uh, to your point, Pete, before when you said that people coming to town, I want to pick your brain, but I also want to ask you for a recommendation for a gig. Um, there's, a, there's a little bit of chutzpah that comes along with a, a question of uh, like that. I've actually had, and Rich, you know this, I, I tagged you in a, uh, or no, I took a picture of a post on LinkedIn recently, two different people that spoke up about uh, people getting, uh, they wanted to use her influence and her uh, LinkedIn profile and the amount of influence she has, the amount of people that follow her. She put up a whole, whole post and she's like, I'm not apologizing about it. This is how I feel. Uh, and because of her following, I call them people in the comment sections that I call them bootlickers are like, great post. I totally agree. I was the one guy and the whole post, the whole gist of it was all about don't come at me and ask me to share something on my wall. If I don't know you or anything, don't come at me with that kind of a thing. Don't even ask me to pick my brain or, you know, or stuff like that. And I was like, I get what you're saying with somebody having the, the, the CO Jones to ask you without even knowing you to share their stuff, to help you get a, 
leg up with a promotional thing, similar to asking for a gig. But where I draw the line, and even as a voiceover guy myself, if somebody reaches out to me and said, hey, can I just talk to you for 15 minutes? How do I start doing this thing? You know, all of us are willing to have those conversations because there's the, the only agenda there is to ask, how do I begin? You know, and a lot of these people that were like on LinkedIn, one voiceover person in particular, she says, don't even ask me to pick my brain. I did all the hard work. How dare you? You know, you want to hack, you want a shortcut. You got. I'm like, dude, come on. When you were coming up, you were asking, you were looking for that kind of information too. Yeah. And, you know, Rich, you came to mind. Uh, because you do that, you'll still take a coffee, you know, within reason and, and time and allowing. You're still willing to have, sit, you know, have to have coffee with somebody. Uh, because what I think a lot of people don't understand it's it's the networking. Uh, it's understanding that this person may all of a sudden come to town, become very influential themselves, and they're going to remember those who helped them and those who didn't. Sure, you know, and there's always they're going to be positive. Um, flows to that you know what i mean there's there's a legacy aspect to it you know well, who did you help and you know yeah help is an interesting word because you can help people um just by having a conversation with them mm -hmm. and i don't think I, I disagree with you in one sense because when everybody has to earn their keep and i totally agree with that and for example, when I moved to New York, um, I had some people that I could call, but all they did, they said, hey, do you want to come down? I'm playing at this bar. Um, come hang. And they might introduce me to somebody. They might not. Um, and I, I think it's a, you know, with social media, I've heard some of the most messed up stories about expectations of people. And you know, if you look at social media and all of a sudden, um, I don't spend much time on it. I probably should spend a little bit more, but I'm I'm not a huge advocate. And but you'll hear like you'll hear a guitar player, you'll hear a drummer, and then what do you do? You'll either share it or you'll pass it along to somebody who will share it. Now mm -hmm. those things they're healthy, but for somebody to come and say, "Hey, I put this together. Will you put it on?" whatever you call it, your feed, your wall. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. The terminology. I mean, that that's asking a lot. I, I've that's never ballsy. Gotten, that's ballsy. I, no, I've no, never, no, I've I, never I, gotten I agree. that. I've never gotten no. that. Hmm. No, I, I haven't either. And, and usually the, you know, the advice, whether it's right or it's wrong, that I give, there are plenty of places to go and hear musicians, whether you know them or not. And to your point, Rich, of what you said before, you know, you're, the advice you got, Okay, this sounds great. You you got a lot of stuff going on here. You need to join the community, and that's you need to join a community. Find, go up to somebody that played a gig you like their playing, and say, "Hey, man, I just moved to town. You sound great." Pick somebody that's of your own age group, yeah, and the music that you like to play, and then see where it leads you. If that doesn't lead you somewhere. Go to the next club. Hear yeah. somebody else play, because something's going to happen. You know. Yeah, for sure. It, you just have is. to be. It, yeah, just, just you have to be open, open to getting out of the house to go see live musicians do their thing, and then be willing to humble yourself, to extend your hand and say good job, and then it, it, you know. To me, that's like putting on a pair of shoes. That's like nothing. But to uh, some people. This is a big thing, but it's, um, yeah. it's a necessary part of any creative pursuit because you have to know the people in the other creatives in the community. Do you remember a few years back, there was like a, a push against those who would, you know, use the term networking, Rich? Well, I mean, it still is a very nasty four letter word to some people. Well, what is it then? I mean, isn't that the, the truth of well, the heart Well, you want to call it doing? now, you want to call it connect. We want to connect. We want to collaborate. We want to- Semantics. You know, it's, it's, <laughs> it, it is, it's, you know, it's it's a business term, but I mean, basically the idea is that you want to connect with birds of a feather, like-minded individuals, 
barstool philosophers, the same people that have the same goals, integrity, you know, you want to connect with these people. You got to go find them. And yeah, you got to become known. And yeah, but also get, social media is a great way to like, you know, um, I mean, I'm friends with Steve Gad's wife. So how am I going to get Steve on the podcast? I'm going through Carol. I'm th friends yeah. with I'm friends with her on Facebook. So she will get a message from me that says, would Steve like to do the thing? So it's a great way to almost bring a to attempt to bring a online relationship into the real world. And that takes effort and energy to do that. But it's a it's a tool. You know, it's a tool. Yeah. Well, with that being said, Pete, can can you find me a Huey Lewis and the News tribute band gig? <laughs> well, I love that band, and I loved didn't uh, you know another band that I loved was uh, Jack Mack and the Heart Attack. Oh yeah. You know, which a lot of people, at least younger people, they don't know about them. But yeah, I I totally agree with you that you know that drummer. What 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 was Bill Huey? Gibson? Yeah, Bill Gibson. Great drummer. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And he's just we're, we're, we're supposed to have him on. And I'm looking forward to that conversation because yeah. I mean, uh, it, it's it's so not 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 a shame, but it's like what an underrated guy. And uh, similar to an Alex Van Halen, he needs yeah. more credit. Man, needs more credit. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Band you know. drummers. You know, it's uh, did you guys hear that story about uh, Charlie Watts? Of course, when he was alive, he was sick, had the flu, and Ginger Baker took him some. Uh, chicken noodle soup i forget where i read this love it knocks on charlie's door charlie's like oh man that's you know it comes with a blanket over his shoulders and man that's really sweet of you and ginger said well i hope you feel better but i can tell you this the rolling stones still suck <laughs> that is so ginger i mean and, wow I know, right? yeah i mean how how crazy of a person do you have to be in your approach to life and your behavior that you get kicked out of cities. Like the mayor goes, you are out. <laughs> right. <laughs> give, give me back the key. <laughs> I mean, dude, that is crazy. Who are, who, who's your Holy grail? Your, your, um, your Mount Rushmore of drummers. I don't know if I can answer that. That's a tough one because a guy who plays a lot of styles like you, you're like, Oh, I got to get it down to like, how many names for this genre? You know what I mean? Well, I can tell you this. You know, in, yeah. in the R&B world, uh, James Gadson. Okay, there you go. You know, I, I will. Yeah, I mean, I, I love the way that guy plays. And there there's some old, you know, some some bands that people aren't aware of. There's a great, great uh, band called Dyke and the Blazers. Are you familiar with them? No. That's Gadson mm -hmm. on that stuff. Wow. Yeah, I'll send, I'll send you some stuff. Okay. And um, he is just, man, for playing that stuff, his pocket. I mean, uh, yeah. I got so many records floating through my head. You know, Gad was. Gad is up there. Yeah. Oh, my God. You know, it's uh, no so matter graceful. what Gad plays. And yeah. it's great hearing stories about people that get to work with him. Um, he was here in town. And I think they were working at Sound Emporium, and I think they were working on Andrea Zahn's record. Oh, nice. That was Gad and Willie Weeks. And uh, you can't get much better of a rhythm section than that, can you? Holy cow. And um, Gad, I think they put him, they were in the A room, and they put him in the sidecar booth. He wasn't out in the main room. And the acoustics in there can be weird. And if you hit cymbals too hard, they'll just choke. So he told everybody, this is the story I heard, whether it's accurate or not, I don't know. But he just said, can you give me like 20, 30 minutes? And he just sat there and played without headphones and basically figured out where his thresholds were so that the kit would resonate the way, you know, his whole, the tone of his kick drum and the way that he plays, of course, he's a tap dancer, so he's not burying the beater into the head. I love the tone of the kick drum. It's... Mm -hmm. It's simple things like that in the way he approaches music. That you know, when I moved here, one of the first drummers that I went and heard was Greg Morrow, and he blew my socks off. Yeah, and such a great guy. Yeah, he is, and 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 he is, you know, if you, I mean, he's done such a wide range of gigs. I don't think people understand just what territory the guy can cover. But when I started working with Ashley Monroe, he had played on her. Um, I call it her sophomore record called Like a Rose. And yeah. 
Um, and I called him up and I was trying to figure out what he was doing. And I said, do you remember what you were playing on this song? And then he said, no. And I, I kind of expected the answer. And I said, you know, can, he goes, what song are you listening to? I told him. And um, I think it was him and uh, Mike Brignardello. Who I I've just never interviewed Mike at, like, an hour yeah, ago. I saw that. Yeah. Man, he's great. Oh, God. And, um, and Greg said, well, knowing me, I probably had a brush under one in one armpit, a brush in one hand, a stick under the other armpit, and a blast stick and something to pick up off the floor, Tom. So he kind of painted a picture in my head of what an artist would do. So as your ears are taking in a song, and Ashley writes, she writes great material, she's got a great voice. He's, he's reacting to the music. So, okay, that needs this touch here and this touch here. That's the first and only time that I've thought of a drummer like that. And then I'd go hear him with Pat McLaughlin and it's, the guy is so solid and his pocket, he doesn't force anything. And it's all based around, it's based around the vocalist yep. or in Pat's, you know, Pat's rhythm guitar when he plays, but he's astounding to me. He really is a special musician. So Yeah. The first time I heard him was on that Dixie Chicks Wide Open Spaces record. And I was like, this sounds different. This sounds like some. this is not what I'm hearing 90s country like on the radio every day. It's something a little bit different. And lo and behold, I found out it was him. And then, oh, my God, years later, became friends, wrote a big feature spread on Modern Drummer for him. And we had screwdrivers together. And, and he's he was on the podcast. I mean, great, great talented cat man you know yeah and just a, a great human being you know southern yeah. gentleman at his finest that that he is <laughs> <laughs> he's a so okay so there's three names you yeah get, wh who, who else one more name one more name um drum rolls no uh, i'm i'm gonna say jeff picaro okay yeah, yeah, that's that's yeah. beautiful. The legacy he created in the 38 years, his body of work to have left us at 38. I was remembering what I was doing at 38, and it wasn't creating that kind of body of work. Unbelievable. Let me include one more guy, Jim Gordon. Okay, yeah. And the, re the reason why I say this, we did the soul singer that I work with here in town, uh, Charles Wig Walker. We've done a record. It's done. Um, Bill Schnee lives here now, and Bill mixed it. And um, I, you know, I've only probably spent a, a little bit of time, two or three times with Bill. But he, of course, he's the guy that uh, did Asia. He did Carly Simon's. Um, You're so vain. Uh, yes, yes, and. I asked him about Jim and I said, did you get to work with him much? And he goes, not nearly enough. So we had a little bit of conversation about him. There have been a multitude of people and I don't think I realized just how great Jim Gordon was. And then I saw a little clip of Jeff talking about him. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he evidently was one of those guys that had that thing where, man, he had it mapped out. He knew what to play, when to play it, how to play it and didn't deviate. He just, just very musical. So yeah, for sure. The record that I have that he played on, I listened to those quite a bit. He's great. Yeah. Well, that, that is amazing. And I, now we're, we're, um, I mean, we're, we're young here, but we're, uh, we're a men of a certain age. What is, what are you looking to in the future? What is your goal for this year? What are you looking for? What are you excited about? Um, getting my pilot's license. Are you really? Um. Yeah. So you, you like taking private lessons? Is that how it works? Yeah, I've got a, a flight instructor out at uh, uh, John Toon Airport. Wow. And um, yeah, just uh, two mornings ago, I did my first solo flight. And that has to be flight. so scary. It, it it's a a, yeah. Well, you spend time learning the environment. And yes, it's scary, you know, when you don't have somebody sitting next to you in the cockpit. But it's uh, it's something I've wanted to do for a long time. And I'll tell you, it's it's the same rush. Like when I got called to do the average white band gig, I ran around my apartment probably five times and then went to a pub and had three beers. And and um, it's it's that same element and level of joy 
now I've got a lot a long way to go, but I want to continue with it. And and uh, but I love the environment. I lucked out. I've got a great flight instructor, and um, um, there there's a drummer here in town that plays with John Party, Will Easterwood. Oh, Rich, do you know him? Well, uh, Will e well John Party's drummer now is uh, Kevin Murphy. You know Kevin Murphquake Murphy. I don't know him. I, I, Big maybe I, I don't know Will very well. I yeah. reached out to him because I knew that he had a plane and he had his pilot's license. Killer. Wow. And, but, you know, they're, yeah, it's just some people take to it and some people don't. My dad was an aeronautical engineer. So um, I like the environment. It's in your blood. Yeah. You have your part 107. <laughs> Part 107, is that from? What is that, Jim? That's uh, if you're a drone operator, that's the license you have to have if you want ah. to do commercial drone flying and shooting and uh, video and stuff like that. So uh, the FAA is requiring uh, pretty much all drone operators, even if you're somewhat of a hobbyist, you have to have a Part 107 FAA general aviation license. Wow. Mm. Okay. Yeah. So I've been uh, studying for that since uh, I'm going on my fourth year of uh, going through the course. Wow. Really, Jim? <laughs> Flying drones? <laughs> it, should, it should only, uh, yeah, to fly a drone, you have to be licensed. Well, Jim's a yeah, videographer as well, but, you know, that industry, the drones have really, uh, is straight from the War of the Worlds. It really is. It's all happening. Any Philip K. <laughs> Dick or Robert Hein, it's all the science fiction stuff. Isaac Asimov, it is, it is all happening. I mean, it really yeah. is, but it did change Hollywood. I mean, you remember you'd have to rent a helicopter or a small airplane to get oh, those, yeah. those establishment shots. And now you just get the drone up there. Boom. It's done. Saves all that money. Totally. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. It really yeah. is. I mean, it's, uh, it's because of the people that uh, a few years back, somebody flew a drone uh, into a uh, football stadium while an NFL game was going on. And they flew it like directly over the crowd even over the players as they were playing, you know, they, they, they've got the, the, um, the air cam, I can't remember what they call it, but the fly cam that uh, is suspended yeah. by the cables. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like, God, you cannot do that. What are you doing? You're, you're say, this is why they have, you know, why we can't have nice things. So. <laughs> well, I'm yeah, excited for you, Pete. Run it. <laughs> that's really exciting. Yeah. You have something, uh, that's kind of like uh, that's kind of like your acting. Like I got all sorts of shade and hate for about five years. I just knew that I wanted to get out of the drums. I wanted to try something different, and I did it. And a lot of my drummer friends were like, "What the hell are you doing? You're not young. Why are you doing this?" And I just oh, I, I don't know. That takes, that takes guts. <laughs> you just gotta you just gotta do it, man. You gotta sure. walk on the tightrope and be willing to like take chances and fall on your face and be bad at something. You know, and um, who cares what other people think? Do it for you. I did it for me, Jimmy. Yeah. Yeah. Are you going to keep doing it? Yeah. I, I, I don't want to do 80 auditions a year to get a toothpaste commercial or a big pharma commercial. You know what I mean? But I know how to hit my mark and create my character and deliver my lines. So as I meet people in the industry and they just basically say, look, and I'm doing in, an indie film and you're perfect for this. I'm want to do it. But, it, you know, the the. uh the craziness of doing the 80 auditions a year. I just don't want to do it. That's what yeah. that taught me. You know, it's a tough business. Yeah. It is tough, oh, it is tough. Yeah. but it's good. It's good because it's tough. tougher than music. I would say def I would say it's tougher because in music, yeah, you, you have to have a skill set. You have to be personal. They, they tend to want you to have a good look, you know, where's your leather jacket kid, you know, but in acting, they're like, you're too short. You're too fat. You're too Brown. You're too, you know, you just, it's, it's, to my everything's you're two or you're wrong you know what i mean so right. there's a yeah. lot of things stacked against you and you have to have incredibly thick skin so, which i had i already had from the music business so um it was a very enjoyable period it really was but that's your that's your acting man that's your realizing that you want to try something different yeah I think for example uh, yeah go ahead you, you got to do it right yeah, yeah. For, you for gotta, example there's there's uh you know you guys familiar with reacher I haven't watched the episode. I want to. Yeah. Oh man, what a great show! But you remember back in the day, uh, they came out with the movie Reacher with Tom Cruise, right? And my wife, who is uh, very familiar with the character of Jack Reacher from the books and everything, she goes, "Wait, Tom Cruise?" And apparently, he had read the books, fell in love with the whole notion of it, and he wanted to play the character. He is the antithesis 
of that character because yeah. he's a giant of a man. And the guy that they picked uh, to be the character in the show, his name is Alan Richson. Yeah, he's and the good. guy is a mountain. I mean, yeah. he's just he fits the character to it. He team. eats like I mean, six perfect. chicken breasts a day. Oh, um, but you know, but the whole the dark and brooding, you know, yeah. I mean, he's just got the. You can do, you know, wash your clothes on his stomach, that kind of thing. I love know? it. Jim, you're really scaring me. But um, anyways, Pete, I really, we, Jim and I both appreciate this conversation and your time. And I haven't seen you in forever. The last time I saw you was, I think, towards the end of last year. I saw you play at uh, Third and Lindsley. Always incredible. It was like a Dave Pomeroy thing. So yeah. let me know, man. You're getting out. You know, I mean, it's freezing cold tonight. I don't think I'm getting out tonight. But let's get out. Let's see some music. Let's uh, kill some brain cells. We'll do the thing. Sounds good, man. Rich, thank you so much for having me, both you guys. And uh, yeah, it was a good, good to meet talk, you. Fun combo. Absolutely, yeah. man. Hey, do you like to be found on the? If someone wants to reach out to you, is there a way to be found? Uh, my telephone number is. Oh, <laughs> 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 uh, you can you can you find can fax me, me at. You can if you look me up on Facebook, you can find me. Facebook it is, Pete Abbott. Ladies and gentlemen, that's Pete Abbott. Man, thanks again for your time, pal. And to all the listeners, be sure to subscribe, share, rate, and review the show. It helps the little algorithms. It helps people find the show. Jim, Jim McCarthy, voiceovers.com. We appreciate your time and talent. And to everybody out there, my plea to you, please, it took a year of my life, pick up from Jeff Bezos on Amazon.com, my new book, Making It in Country Music, an insider's look at the industry. Sure appreciate it. Pete, thanks again, man. Thanks, guys. This has been The Rich Redman Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredman.com forward slash podcasts.